This is what I'm going to share today. So I want to just cover the story of my tech high, disruptive innovation cycle I want to touch on a little bit, business strategy decisions that brought me where I am today, some important lessons learned, and some next steps. And actually, I'd love to get some, if we have time at the end before we go to Q&A, uh, use you as an advisory council. What would you recommend on some of the key questions I have at the end? So uh, let's go with, I'm going to switch this. There we go. So story of my tech high. So a little more detail on my introduction. Uh, we talked about education. Uh, There's a picture of my family. Uh, I've got a boy on a mission in Italy. My other son who got home about a year ago from South Africa mission and my future daughter-in-law. They were engaged recently, kind of cool. Uh, they're here today, so I want to call them out. Um, and so I served a mission in Uruguay, uh, down and part-time in Brazil, part-time in Uruguay. And uh, anyway, I just learned to love teaching. I came back and came to BOU and switched my major from engineering to teaching. And I went and taught sixth grade for five years up in Washington State. And as part of that, I got a grant to bring the internet into the classroom. This was back in the mid-90s. So it was a brand new thing to have online learning. I just jumped into it, loved it, and I've been involved with online education ever since. Uh, after that, I got a job offer from Novell to run uh, a software company here in Provo. So I left teaching, went to Novell, and ran their online training program for about six years. Uh, they sent me to a Stanford program, came back into business marketing. So anyway, I have all kinds of experiences with business, marketing, entrepreneurship, uh, education, online learning. Um, my master's degree program in education was around choice. Uh, you hear a lot about choice in public education, charter schools, magnet schools, uh, vouchers, all that choice in education is a really interesting space. Um, anyway, as part of all that, I always, as a teacher, just to support a family, I always had entrepreneur pursuits on the side. While at Novell, uh, during the layoff years, there was always a backup plan, so I always had online, or I always had entrepreneurship uh, pursuits in the in the background as well. And that's what one of them was, was the, the Donald Trump thing, which is a fun story for another day. Uh, and then I've chaired business and entrepreneurship. I've just been involved in that, in, in that community for many years and just love it. And so about 2009, I was actually in, and I made this note here, I was, a, I was invited to speak at a uh, Center for Entre Entrepreneurship and Technology conference here at BYU. And during one of the panels, they had some tech all-stars, some tech CEOs here, as, as well as BYU computer science professors. And they were kind of arguing how, how BYU computer science doesn't necessarily teach them practical job applications that, for workers to go do for the tech companies. And someone said, well, you should get high schools to do that. And everybody kind of laughed. And I was sitting in the chair, uh, it was a room just like this, I don't know which room it was, but up there and realized, you know what? With my education background, my technology background, entrepreneurship background, I bet I could do that. And voila, I started it. So that's, so I was literally sitting in a chair just like you are, had an idea, had a vision, had a concept of what I'd, I wanted to do, and, it, and then I went to work and did it. I put together this, this is kind of the vision statement, and we literally haven't changed this since the beginning. Uh, kind of a patriotic uh, feeling where it started was America was founded on the principles of innovation and entrepreneurship. And schools don't teach that much at all. Uh, and I also believe that every child learns differently. So you need to build a personalized education plan with each child. And then third, a strong foundation is in technology is essential for college, career, and life. So I said, you know what, let's have this be our vision and let's go to work. So if anyone's familiar with the public education system, it is in need of disruption. Uh, and I was actually in a, uh, at the U, uh, Utah Technology Council Hall of Fame dinner where Eric Schmidt spoke a number of years ago, and he pointed out where, how there's been lots of innovation in higher ed, but he hasn't seen any significant innovation in K-12. And I kind of took that as a challenge. I said, you know what, I'm gonna figure out how to disrupt a little bit of the K-12 education system. Uh, the gentleman on the right, you, should, you know, I'm sure you all know, Clayton Christensen, who is the, the global thought leader of disruptive innovation. 
And I thought, you know, I'm going to look at his pattern of how he suggests people go about disrupting industries, and I'm going to try to follow it. And I did. I was able to look at what he calls non-consumers, and I found that, in fact, there are non-consumers of the public K-12 system. It's called students who choose to opt out of their local school and want to do online, private, or school at home. I thought, you know what, they're not consuming the public education system. Would that fit into Clayton's model of disruptive innovation? And it did. So I found these non-consumers. I asked them what they wanted to be able to come back into the system and designed a program around what they wanted. And I actually ended up sharing that story with Anyone know the, that guy's name? Anyone? I heard it. It's Michael Horn. He works for Clayton Christensen Institute, and he's over disruptive education innovation. So I shot him an email. I said, hey, Michael. And I you know, stole him this story about my tech high, and this was his, his response. Extraordinarily interesting. Very intrigued by all this. Thanks for sharing. And I thought, you know what? Because I, I said, I've kind of followed Clayton's disruptive innovation model and tried to apply it to K-12, and you know, I've kind of got it to work. Uh, I put that $600 billion on that slide. Uh, that's with a B. That's a lot of money. Uh, that is essentially what our government, collective of all the states in the United States, spend on K-12 education every year. So that's public dollars spent on educating kids grades one, you know, one through 12 in our country. It's about $600 billion. So definitely worth trying to crack into some of that as a disruptive uh, innovate, innovator. Uh, I wanted to share this. Who else has been trying to disrupt K-12? Some very famous and great people. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Anyone know how much he gave to the New Jersey Department of Education K-12 system? 100 million. He said, you know what, I'm going to give some of my Facebook money to New Jersey. He donated 100 million to help them. Now, I won't you know, necessarily talk about the, the results of all that, but he, he tried. Uh, everyone knows Bill Gates and that foundation is heavily invested in trying to disrupt and provide a better world for our K-12 education system. Oprah is big into the education space, always, you know, even globally, trying to build schools and help kids have access to meaningful education. Uh, anyone know this gentleman? George Lucas, Star Wars. He started a foundation, actually it was, re, it was soon after they sold Star Wars to Disney, uh, Anyone know how much, so the ed Edutopia is intended to try and disrupt or at least enhance the value of K-12 public ed. Anyone know how much he donated to that cause of K-12 education? Four billion D donated. Look it up, yeah, he, he donated four billion dollars of his wealth to help education improve. I mean, so again, just talk about the scale of how many people are trying to do something. And that's on top of the 600 billion spent a year, right? On, so anyway, and that's just public ed. Uh, so lots of things are happening. Continuous innovation. So once you kind of disrupt, you always have to be continuously innovative. Uh, I've been, you know, over the years, been a fan of the lean startup model and thought, you know what, can I apply that to education? Uh, the business model generation of constantly iterating based on customer feedback. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of people, uh, let me ask you this. If you were to say, who is the, in the K-12 public education system, who's the customer? Parents and students, how many would say parents or students? Seems like a reasonable answer. Any other ones that you would think someone might call? Society at large benefits by an educated populace? Colleges. Colleges. For a lot of, for most K-12 educators, their customer is the college. The product is the child. And they're trying to, they assess them all the time to see if the QA is good and if they're ready and if they're ready to hand off to college or industry or society, right? But 
The product is the kid. I view the product as a quality education service and that the customer is the parent and child. And once you make that shift in an educational strategy, it's so interesting how many people disagree with you, number one. But what it does is allows me to say, you know what, how can I provide a better service to your child, parent? What do you want? And that's what I've been doing for six years, is just this iterative, every year, where I, you know, I meet with thousands of parents, just say, what do you want your child's education to be like? And let's go design it for them. And it's powerful what that produces in a child's motivation, choice, education, all that stuff, as well as parents' commitment to it. And, uh, and it's, just been, it's just been a great experience. So I wanted to connect the dots with that to how this, these types of uh, strategies in business are applicable to many different types, not just, oh, go find out what your customer wants technology-wise and build it for them so they'll buy it. But really, you can ex expand and apply these types of principles in many different ways. So hopefully that was a helpful tie on, on some of those business strategies you hear all the time. I really believe in listening. You know, don't just go off in a corner and build something and then launch it big. Launch it small. Ask what your customer wants. Build it. Improve it. Get feedback. You know, that, that continuous cycle. Okay, next I want to share some key business strategy decisions that kind of I have been able to make over these uh, past six years that I hope as I pass them on to you will help you in your pursuit of entrepreneurship to decide which kind of fork in the road you're going to take, okay? So hopefully that's, this, this will be a helpful segment. So first one, and again, I'm not saying this is the right order to go through. These are just the thoughts I had in my mind that I wanted to share. First was around this for-profit or non-profit. I was watching a documentary on Walmart one day. I can't remember where, where I was. And they were talking about the executives of Walmart living in a state of paranoia and meeting like literally six or uh, at least six days a week. Like every Saturday morning, the executive team from Walmart, apparently this is the documentary we're showing, gathers on Saturday morning to look at that week's sales. And they live in paranoia that they're going to lose their market share to Target or to another retailer. And I was like, man, I don't want to skid into a business where you, you're freaking out every day about losing market share and having to meet seven days a week and, tw you know, 100 hour weeks to fret over losing. You know, that just didn't, so I was like, I'm not gonna do a for profit. I'm gonna go non profit. And so I invested, I actually started a small 51C3 at a time and went into that route. And then I realized, well, the place I need to go get raise money are those businesses over there, right? It's the profits of corporations that donate to non profits to have them operate, or you just beg your clients and customers to donate to you so you can provide a free service or whatever. You know, there's all different makes and models in there. But I was kind of like, well, I don't really know. I kind of like both sides. And so I ended up kind of split in the middle. Uh, I presented to other social entrepreneurship classes here at BYU. And I believe that you can find a business pursuit that can do good in the world. And you can also make it profitable. And so that was kind of my personal approach to how I wanted to view the, the business. Anyone know that guy's name? All right, nice. Josh Coates, founder, CEO. Oh, is it on there? Oh. Who was No, sorry. <laughs> That's funny. And so the other one had a name too, didn't it? <laughs> oh, you're good, man. That's funny. All right. Uh, so Josh Coates is the founder of... Uh, well, of Mosey and sold that to EMC for like 72 million. Anyway, he became a professor here and helped start Canvas, a learning management system. Uh, I was visiting with him and, and listened to some of his similar lectures like this. And he said, look, right from the start, decide if you're going to build a lifestyle company that is bootstrapped by yourself and your savings and you just want to have a good lifestyle company or decide if you're going to go VC route and scale and sell route. 
And I, I can testify today that that was the best advice I had ever received. I needed that. And he said, look, both are valuable. Both are, are worthy pursuits. But decide up front which one you're going to take. Because most, he said, entrepreneur kids in Utah and students are, do it some other way. They start off with a lifestyle company and then they find themselves, you know, burning 100 hours a week and then they say, oh, I should sell this. And so they switch it to a VC and they get frustrated that their books aren't done right. And, you know, it just gets messy when you try to merge in between the two. So just pick it. Say, do you want to create a business that you can enjoy freedom and flexibility of time as well as make profit? Or do you want to just kind of burn heavy and try to go VC to sell and scale and then retire? Right? So, I mean, kind of, kind of pick your path. And that was really helpful, helpful to me. So I hope that helps you in your pursuit of a business venture. Pick your path and then run with it. Don't try to then go VC route and then say, oh, but I'm so, I wish I could be home at night at five or whatever. Right? You may not be able to do that. If, if you want a lifestyle, do a lifestyle company. If you want to go big and sell and scale, scale and sell, then you may give up some of your lifestyle. So anyway, hopefully that helps. Uh, and this is related to this. This is one of my favorite kind of analogies I heard that cemented that. Uh, anyone ever heard this analogy? Probably not, because I kind of merged it from others. So <laughs> maybe you have. So uh, this MBA is on, you know, it takes his one week off a year to go down to the Bahamas or whatever, and he sees this guy sitting on the, on the beach, uh, you know, just lounging around, sees him, in the, you know, every day that week, he just sees him kind of his pattern, and the guy, you know, about one o'clock goes, gets in his boat, and goes out, fishes, brings home food for his family, and then chills on the beach the rest of the night. And the NBA guy comes up to this, this fisherman and says, oh, man, Look at what you have out here. We could, you know, if I got you some funding, we could get you another boat. You could have a whole crew go out there all day long and fish, and you could sell fish around the world, and you could do this and this and this and this. And the fisherman turns to him and says, Oh, why would I do all that? And the guy says, So you can sit around on the beach all day. <laughs> you get it? He said, I'm already doing that. <laughs> why do I need to do all that other stuff? to do what I'm already doing, right? And so it just kind of cemented, maybe there's an opportunity to find a lifestyle business that meets your particular personal needs and find out what you're doing it for and go backwards from there. Anyway, I hope that helps a little bit. It helped me a lot. Um, all right, let's move on to some lessons learned. Uh, Michael Porter, who is he? Uh, he is a Harvard business professor that one of this quote in and of itself, I've quoted probably a hundred times in the past six years to people who are trying to sell me a growth drug. So that's the header, avoid the growth drug. Because remember, I chose, oh, I didn't tell you. I chose in my tech high business to make it a lifestyle business. I did not choose to go VC scale and sell route. I should have made that clear on that slide. Uh, and so as that decision was made to make a My Tech High where we service kids very well in a program that they love and it, it is a good, profitable lifestyle company, um, this one has come up over and over again. Anytime you go to a business setting or meeting or event, it's the growth drug that they're trying to get me, I feel, to do, which is... Hey, Matt, have you thought about selling your courses here? Have you thought about translating courses? Have you thought about doing this? this, this? And they rattle off like 15 things that they think I should be doing in my company to make it grow faster. And I have to say, no, I'm good. Thanks. And it usually makes them like freak out that someone would say that. But I quote this. I say, you know what? The key, the, ass the essence of strategy isn't what you're going to do next year. It's really about what you're not going to do. And I, for me, again, this is just Matt Bowman experience, right? I'm not teaching a book on this, but that's what's worked for me is to say, you know what? There are dozens and dozens of pursuits every day I could pursue. I could chase, I could build, I could do, and they'd all work. I don't doubt that. 
But the essence of strategy to me is choosing carefully what you're not going to do. So anyway, again, I hope that helps you. So, oh, the numbers got, that's all right. All, all three of them. Uh, and that's actually a good dichotomy. You can't have three number ones. Right, so the translation in slides uh, should say one, two, and three on purpose. But uh, the key is I identified three business strategies. So this is the MyTechI business model right here if you want to know. Manage a full-time online personalized program through public schools. And I'll describe that because that's the business model that I'm in for the past six years. Number two, we said, you know what? Once we've built that, we'll have some good tech courses. You know, that first one's focused on technology and entrepreneurship. That's the, the theme of our program. So number two pursuit is, you know what? I bet people, private pay people, instead of publicly funded students, private pay parents would purchase these standalone tech courses for their kids. So you know what? That's a business pursuit number two. Business pursuit number three is, I bet we could also, if we wanted to, create a sales team and go license these courses to, to public schools who don't have many resources to, to, tell, to teach their kids technology and entrepreneurship. Right? They, that's a kind of a gap. Our schools are trying to teach coding and robotics and digital media and game design and Flash and all this stuff. Um, so, well, not Flash anymore, actually. Uh, and license these courses to... Uh, to schools. So that was our three-part business strategy. To date, after six years, we're still doing number one. Again, that was because it was a lifestyle choice that we, if we can make number one profitable and good and a quality service to kids to helping them and their parents, then why do number two and why do number three if it just creates more chaos in your, in your life? And so we're on number one right now. So let me share with you kind of the model just of number one. Uh, school receives funding from the state for each child. We contract with a school to manage this online program based on technology and entrepreneurship for them. That's, and then we also, because we're required, go out and source from other companies their math, English, history, and science curriculum. We, we chose not to build that because there's so many versions of that out there that, and based on different needs of each child we would tailor it to them. So we don't do core uh, ourselves. We license core from others and we build our own tech and entrepreneurship classes. So that's our business model. I just want, because I'm so excited about, these are our 27 now tech courses for kids. And how many of you would have liked some of these when you were in first grade all the way to 12th grade? Right? I mean, these are, our kids love these courses. I mean, who, I mean, we've got everything. And it's, it's 27, no one else in the market has, you know, maybe the most our competitor has is six. Right? And, I mean, those titles, I mean, it's just awesome. I love looking at this of what we've been able to build over, over these six years and provide to students on these topics that they love. Yeah? Who offers your courses? Uh, we find a variety of teachers, course developers, instructional designers, and technologist guys and gals. Is it possible for people at our level to start this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In fact, uh, Steve brought up MOOCs. I always thought, you know what, I want to try a MOOC. Everyone wants to. So I tried, I have taught now two MOOCs. I chose this one right here, our Google Ninja for Beginners course. So you know what, I'll just open that up for free, call it a MOOC, and I got 5,200 people in about almost every country in the world you can name was in my course, and the average age was probably 40. And some as old as like 80 would post and say, I'm trying to figure out how to email, use calendar, and you know, Google Docs with slides, presenta you know, presentation, and, and Excel and Word equivalents, right? And so, that one was a really popular course, and the next time I ran it, we had maybe 2,200 or something. Uh, it, was, it was the same list that we sent the first one to, so I, I, I was even surprised at that. Um, but 
what I found is that since we've tailored it to a 12-year-old, that's our target age group. Actually, our average age in our program is 10, believe it or not. Uh, and the 12-year-old is who we've designed our, tar our target course around. And the adult l learners love that. It wasn't intimidating like other adult and dry and boring type adult courses are. This was fun, colorful, interactive, uh, you know, engaging. And so we actually had a lot of adults like that Google Ninja course. And even one of our partners had a, had a guy from a rest home show up and say, there's 400 of us in this rest home that all need to learn about computers. Will you come teach us? Right? So that's a whole other market that I'm going to say no to. Right? It's just trying to service an adult education market who needs many of these skills. But if you're interested, you can go buy this right now for $350 online, if you want. <laughs> but you'll be paired up with a bunch of kids, because that's in our system right now. Uh, anyway, so cool courses. I love it. It's fun to see what kids can build out of all of this. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very engaging. We have interactive uh, things they do. They do assignments and discussion forums and projects and quizzes and you know, demo videos, all that stuff. So anyway, kind of cool. So what's been my marketing strategy? Well, the lesson learned. This is the most important. And you know, I hate to say it. I think if you just learn this one quote, you could skip all the marketing classes. <laughs> Only because I have found this is one of the most essential marketing lessons ever. And maybe you need a little explanation, right? Be irresistible to a small group of passionate sneezers. Maybe you can assume what that means. Sneezers is just someone that will spray your message to their friends and family naturally. If you can be irresistible irresistible to a certain group of people who have passion for what you're providing them and they sneeze and sneeze and sneeze that's the most enjoyable marketing status you could ever achieve and you know what it has worked for us in our particular program we marketed in traditional sense year one and have not done any marketing since and our numbers went from 92 the first year to we're forecasting this fall nearly 2,000. And this is in a full-time Utah only. So this is Utah only kids in this public school program in Utah. And that's because I believe of Seth Godin's uh, quote. Be irresistible to the people you serve and then serve them well with what you give them and they'll sneeze and tell their friends and family about it. And that's a powerful marketing, the, the most powerful marketing strategy I think you could have. Pursuit number two. Remember I said we're still on number one. Well, guess what? We're finally, after six years, we're saying, maybe we should do business pursuit number two now. One is, you know, stable, growing. We've got the whole, we've built systems around that. We've got processes and all that stuff you need when you start, you know, growing and stabilizing. So maybe we should pursue business pursuit number two. So I've kind of said, all right, sometime this year, let's pursue business pursuit number two, which is selling our 27 tech courses that we've built for our Utah program to the world, right? So we have launched a new website. This is now what we've done. We've just kind of left it there. We have not done any proactive marketing on it yet. Uh, you know, I'm very much a methodical kind of person and we're going to launch when we're absolutely ready that everything is perfect from purchase down to finish the course. And, uh, and I want to make some updates to the courses before we totally jump in and mark this. But it is available today. If someone, and we get, we get stragglers, 10, 20 people you know, every you know, month maybe that purchase and get into a course. Uh, but we, you know, haven't done anything, anything significant. So, uh, and this is kind of my wrap-up slide, is help me. What are your, you know, ad advice or insights I'd love to hear around some of these questions uh, that we currently are, you know, literally evaluating as we go. 
right now in terms of number two. So should we spin it out? Should we spin out number two as a VC scale and sell entity uh, and do it just like you're supposed to do it from scratch to, to go big? Uh, or should we keep it as a lifestyle company and just automate it and you know, have a good little ride of the online standalone tech course sales? Uh, we were kind of debating that right now. Should I personally, should I shift my focus on the new pursuit? Or should I hire someone to run that new pursuit and I keep doing the lifestyle side of my tech high in Utah? There's pros and cons. Should we look to acquire or hire competitive people or the people in our competitors that might help us grow more than them? Or should we just focus on our own and, and rock it and dominate the, the market? How do I know on the, on the pursuit number two if we engage in a system and we can it really scale to what you know, the techies say can? Oh, this system will go to a million users at once. Well, what if we can get those? Because we have some cool courses and Minecraft's pretty hot and we teach a course on Minecraft and it's our most popular course right now, uh, the Mi Minecraft Java course. And you know, I, I bet we could get 10,000, maybe 100,000 in a year or two. Uh, you know, can your system go there? I don't know. People keep saying, well, hey, there's a whole international market. Let's just translate your top five courses. Or should we keep those in English? And, and you know, tech, the language of tech is typically English. China requires English starting in fifth grade. So by sixth or seventh grade, maybe they have some, enough English to just, you know, we have demos of how to do stuff in the program. Those programs aren't localized, but should the content be? Or do you just tell them to go for it and figure it out? They're kids, they can handle it. Uh, should we focus, you know, we've got a list of five to ten courses requested by parents on all, con you know, Arduino robotics and uh, you know, you saw the, the new Lego, the EV3 robotics, or, uh, you know, just name your technology. There's so many things out there we could build. Should we just focus on beefing up the catalog some more? Or just focus on the current ones? Should we simultaneously license our courses to schools while we're pursuing private pay? Or should we, or, sh you know, because they're totally different markets, selling to schools or selling to a private pay parent. Should we do them simultaneously, or should we wait and do one after the other? Uh, for a business model pursuit number one, my tech high full-time program in Utah, there's 50 other states out there. Should we just take the lifestyle number one and go to another state? We've looked at that for a couple years. My passion is around disruptive education and ed reform, and I keep getting invited to different legislative meetings and you know, nonprofit meetings that are out to change the world of education, and you know, should I spend my time instead just promoting how schools can teach coding, and even if they don't license our stuff, just promote being an advocate for school change and, and improvement of kind of a broken system. That's K-12. Or my one of the things that still tempts me is should I focus on this broken higher ed system? that all of us are in right now. We recognize there's issues with it. Uh, and all the time I'm meeting with parents who are, of parents who are juniors and seniors in high school, saying, oh, you know, we can't wait to get them into college. And then I talk to the parents who have their 19 and 20 year old in college and they're like, we had the best personalized education experience in the youth that we could ever envision and now our kids are in these classes of 500 and sit and bored out of their head. And, you know, we had this great learning experience in high school. And now they go to college and don't experience that. And I feel bad telling them that, yeah, they should just go to college and might not be a good fit for everybody. So anyway, should I focus some time and energy on lessons learned from these entrants into the higher ed market, into how higher ed might better meet their personalized education needs?